<clears throat> well, good evening, church. It's good to be with you again. Thank the Lord for another uh, beautiful day that he's given us for warmth again, for some sunshine. And I know it's uh, beginning to uh, cloud up, but just thank the Lord for the day and uh, just for being able to, to have time in his word for the services this morning for all those that were able to come out and be a part of it. And for those of you that joined us on Facebook or YouTube, we just want to thank the Lord for you also. And I've got a lot to pray about tonight. i got several on our hearts that, uh, oh, that have so many needs. Do uh, pray for all of our sick in our church. I ask you to continue to pray for the ones that have uh, lost loved ones. There's just been so many that uh, have lost loved ones over the last two years and it just uh, just the incredible numbers and in but we just uh, know that god is able to comfort as only he can I do pray tonight for uh, all of our churches around that uh, as uh, more and more of them are beginning to i guess uh, reopen uh, have more classes more services that God would see fit that we would be able to just reach the people in our community, uh, reach the people in our nations. Um, tonight, we're going to be probably in the third chapter of the book of Mark. We've got a couple things first before we get on into that, and so I'm not sure how far we'll get into there. But uh, do do be much in prayer for uh, Brother Chris, uh, as, uh, as we said this morning, next Sunday morning. Uh, if you can come and be with us, please do. If you can't, join us on Facebook or YouTube. Uh, next Sunday morning, uh, Brother Christmas Guinness will uh, be uh, standing and preaching for the first time since he announced his call to the ministry. So uh, just praise God for that. Pray for his family. Continue to pray for uh, all of our discipleship classes. Pray for people that are traveling this week in uh, uh, as they are uh, on spring break, I know several families that uh, left yesterday morning uh, that are traveling, that are uh, will be out of the area for several days, but just pray that they would have safety in their travels, that they would have a, a, a wonderful time while they're away, that God would just give them some relaxation, some uh, um, time of rejuvenating and, uh, and recharging and be able to come back and truly be uh, ready to to celebrate the season. You know, we're coming up on Easter, just uh, a little over three weeks away, I think. Uh, and uh, then uh, it is, we're approximately three weeks away, Easter. So, uh, and, and we need to remember, the, you know, the greatest thing that was ever done for us. Christ came to earth, and then he was willing to die for each and every one of us. You know, the Father gave his uh, Son to pay the price that we couldn't pay. And I thank him for that. And do uh, pray for our church members that are um, taking care of sick family members. I ask you to remember uh, Elmo and Brenda Smith as Brenda is healing from her uh, broken hip and is still in the hospital. Uh, and uh, uh, don't know how long she'll be there. Don't know how long it'll take the healing process. But uh, just uh, so many others I ask you to remember my cousins, uh, uh, Bay of Christie and Shanna, as they uh, care for their mother in her, you know, the hospice people have said it to won't be much longer. But, uh, you know, only the good Lord knows the day and the hour that he's going to call someone home. So I ask you just to pray for them. Pray for my cousin Lynn, who is uh, at uh, Vanderbilt Hospital. Um their doctors are working to strengthen him and, and prepare him to potentially have a liver transplant if, uh, if they can get him strong enough and one becomes available. So just a lot of things on our heart. Uh, just to pray for some unspoken requests that we have, some that have been uh, people have asked us to, to pray for but wanted us to, to keep them confidential. But God knows all these things. He knows the needs and uh, just uh, pray for our children as we're coming up on Easter egg hunt. And I know that some were starting to, uh, you know, get really excited about that. And But uh, we need to remember the true meaning of Easter. You know, we want to get the children together and hunt eggs and let them have some candy. But always pointing to what the true gift of Easter is. 
But we're going to pray tonight and then get right on in to study of God's Word. Because uh, uh, prayer and God's Word are the things we need more than anything. Uh, and I ask you to pray for us as, as everything is blooming. It's beautiful. Uh, but uh, my allergies are making it difficult to keep my throat uh, opened up to be able to speak. Uh, so uh, I know for some, y'all are saying yay, but, uh, um, you know, pastor may not speak so long. You know, I got a good cup of hot coffee here to help loosen it up to keep me going. So, uh, but join me as we pray tonight. Father, as we come to you, we just want to praise you. <clears throat> Father, I praise you for loving us so much that you gave your son to die for, for all of us, Lord. God, for whosoever will. That, Lord, that those that would call on the name of Jesus, God, those that would confess and, and surrender unto Jesus, Lord. And I pray tonight that you would just help us, that we would be a people that wouldn't just profess with our mouth, God, but we would live with our heart and with our hands, our feet, our very actions, our very lives would be evidence of what Christ has done in our hearts, Lord. And I pray, Father, for this nation as we see so many things going on, God, we see the troubles, the heartaches, God. We see uh, the the issues happening uh, in our nation, God. The the laws, just Father, just so many things that are happening, and and we realize that God sometimes you allow things to happen that brings judgment upon a people that's been disobedient, Lord. And, and I know that we have been a disobedient nation. But, Father, I pray if it be your holy will that you would spare us from this judgment, that you would help us to see the errors of our ways, Lord God, that you would help the, the people, Father, to cry out to you and call out to you and, and return to you. And, Father, we just ask, Lord, as we open your word, as we begin to study your word and begin to think about your word, God, that you would just show us uh, what you would have us to see. God, that it would be a strength to us. It would be a guide to us. God, it would be a help that we might better be able, God, to serve and honor you. Father, we love you and we praise you. And all these things we'd ask in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> in uh, <clears throat> I was reading through uh, some stuff this afternoon and I had come across a, a quote from a Korean Christian that uh, during a time when you know it's uh, in North Korea if you're found to be a Christian it uh, doesn't go very well with you you know they don't uh, allow Christianity they don't allow religion uh, in their country and but as a uh, Korean Christian had said and someone was asking him about his boldness and he says once you have died unto Christ uh, you have no fear of man and I begin to think about that. You know, we, we think about the things going on in this land and in this world and God, uh, what could happen, the, the terrible tragedies that could happen. But when we have uh, died with Christ and been resurrected in the newness of Christ, you know, we shouldn't have to fear men. We shouldn't fear men because Jesus loves us so much that he gave his life for us and you know, and as uh, the, some scripture I quoted this morning, Hebrews thirteen eight says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And for me, that just kind of spoke to me today. The fact that things change here. And uh, I was listening to a, a preacher who had been a missionary in, in uh, uh, Hong Kong. And he and his family had been expelled from Hong Kong because uh, they said glitches in their paperwork and um, most likely because of their stand for Christianity. But uh, it's talking about how that things you know, over the last year have truly changed on this earth. And it has been a year now since it seems like that the wheels started falling off of everything with the pandemic. But said things may have changed on earth over the last year, but not in heaven. You know, think about that. And as I was heard that quote, I began to think about it, that Christ Jesus... Uh, died for you and me, that he gave his life's blood for us, and that even though things here in this earth may change, um, they've not changed in heaven. And 
in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. I'm going to read this, and then I'm going to get on over into the book of Mark. But it says, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And church, when we hold true to the fact that all of creation, um, he spoke this world into existence. If you read back over in the book of Genesis, uh, Christ was right there with the Father. The Father said, let us make man in our image, speaking in the plural sense, speaking to uh, the Son, the Spirit, the triune God. And church, we need to understand that even though things change in our land, in our communities, in our churches, in our families, the assurance is the fact that Christ never changes. God is still on the throne. Christ is still on the right hand making intercession for those that would call upon him. And that's where our hope is. That's where our hope is. And, you know, our hope can't be in, you know, what we receive. It can't be on what we get. And you know, what uh, the prosperity prosperity religions say, but in as we're going to be reading here in the book of Mark, we're going to read through about three or four verses, maybe five verses at the beginning, and see how far we get. But you know, as we've been reading, people have started to come to Jesus because of stuff. They've come to Jesus to see the miracles. They've come to Jesus to get physical healing. They've come to Jesus for what they could receive. Uh, and th they were losing vision on who he is. And I think sometimes we do the same things. Sometimes when things are going great, you know, and we just want to praise him on Sunday morning, and uh, we, we think about that. But then when trials come and heartaches come, I know someone told me uh, a few years back when they were going through a very, very difficult time, the loss of a child. And they said, you know, during times like that is when you have to determine, do you believe God and trust him for what he gives you? Or do you trust him and believe in him for the fact that he's God and he's worthy? And, uh, you know, here in the book of Mark, people were beginning to gather in so much so that Jesus was having to find bigger places and different places and move out uh, of, of the, the towns and out into the wilderness and out onto the seaside and the mountainsides and places in order to be able to minister because of the crush of the people were so great. And then, but one thing he always did when he went into areas, he would go into the synagogue, he would go into the temple, he would go in and teach uh, and because he believed in that, he he came to the Jews, he came to his people, and that was the place that teaching was happening. But it was also a place where it was beginning to be that the Pharisees were trying their best to hinder him, to stop him, to trip him up, if you would. And as we're going to read this, it talks about the man with the withered hand and, and Christ uh, healing him, and it being the Sabbath. And some believe that uh, that this was a set up situation that possibly that they brought this man in uh, because quite often in that time uh, and uh, that uh, people with infirmities were considered unclean and not allowed into the synagogues. So you know it was kind of unusual for somebody to have an infirmity in this in this manner to be inside the synagogue. Now, they could maybe be outside in the outer areas where the beggars were and all, but it was saying here, it says, again, he entered the synagogue and a man was there with a withered hand and they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And, you know, that would make you think as you read that, this man that probably traditionally in that time would not have been in the synagogue was in there and it starts right off and it says and they watched jesus to see whether he would heal you know they were looking to see whether jesus was going to do something uh that's the reason some say and believe that this was kind of a set up situation 
that the Pharisees were looking for another reason to accuse him for another, you know, uh, strike against him for some more things to, to line up against him. And, you know, it's uh, in uh, you, you'll notice that one of the big times that they attacked him was the Sabbath. Because as we've talked over the last couple of weeks, in the mission, they have 20 some chapters concerning the keeping of that. I mean, they have like 39 different rules and regulations on keeping the Sabbath and to honoring the Sabbath. You know, they, they've taken one of the commandments and expanded it to a volume of books, uh, trying to impose their will and their uh, ideas on it. And so as we look at this, you know, Jesus was a compassionate individual. Uh, it's uh, He didn't often, it seems, though, as if you'll read and, and throughout the Scripture, he didn't walk by the those that were infirmed. He didn't walk by those that were in need. He uh, st- stopped, took time, uh, took opportunity to minister to them. And, you know, they hated uh, him because, you know, they were self-appointed experts, uh, as as we've said several times, the Pharisees were kind of they considered themselves the the keepers of the law, the the keepers of the religion, making sure the religion was going to remain pure, re- remain in the manner in which they desired it to be. And they uh, the self appointed experts they they were looking for the Messiah to come in the manner in which they thought. You know, he was teaching. Uh, it was contradictory to the the very expertise that they were espousing, because he was teaching love and compassion. He was teaching, you know, grace and forgiveness. Uh, they were teaching the rules and the laws and the the sacrifices. And you know, they built a lifetime out of their laws, their rituals, their ceremonies. And uh, Jesus, though, and but if you there again, if you look back over here, Jesus came into the synagogues. He came into the places. He he honored a lot of these things, but he also looked at people with compassion and love. And, you know, and they weren't, uh, you know, Jesus was saying that salvation was not earned by keeping rules and regulations or by the rituals or the ceremonies, but it was a gift from the Father through the Son. You know, what does the Word say? That it is uh, for by grace through faith are you saved, not of works, lest any man should boast, for it is the gift of God. You know, not by the righteousness, by the works, by the deeds, by the things that we do. It's a gift of God by the faith that we have in Him and His marvelous grace toward us. Uh, th- those are the things that that He was saying. And you know, but it's it's easy for us to get in the, <clears throat> I guess the the realm of being a religious people, following the rules, following the patterns, and in church. Uh, um, you realize and know that I, I believe we should have standards and we should follow, but it should follow what the Word of God says, not necessarily just the made up traditions that we may or may not have. Because we look around our country and we see traditions of plenty, we see traditions all over the place. You know, I was reading an article this afternoon about uh, a, a group of religious individuals really. Uh, coming down on the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, who recently, um, I guess, disfellowshipped some churches because these churches um, had uh, began to espouse LGBTQ um, st- uh, tolerances. They would say, you know, you could be these families and can come in as long as you said that you love the Lord that was enough and you could come in and be a part of their church and be members of their church and teach classes in their church and the Southern Baptist Convention disfellowshipped itself from some of these churches because that they didn't stand for the standards uh, biblical standards on sexuality the biblical standards on gender the biblical standards because God made male and female not man. It's not our choice. It's not our design. It was God's design. All we're to do is listen to these things. So Jesus was looking at things from the way that the Father was looking at things. He was steadfast on the way the fathers were looking at things. It was the Pharisees 
that had perverted them and had changed them and made them into things that were more pleasing to themselves. And we see that in our world today. And, you know, I'm, I'm not one big on standing up and we need to rail against this and we need to rail against that. We need to be telling them more what we're for. But what we're for is what thus saith the word of God. If God's word calls it a sin, then there's no debate. It's a sin. Jesus was saying that uh, he came up and this man with a withered hand and they were watching him and they were thinking, OK, we're going to see what he's going to do here. Is he going to break our rules? Because if you read the standards that was set for the Sabbath, they weren't set in uh, concerning these things weren't set in scripture. They were set in uh, physical law. They were set by the Pharisees, by the scribes, the priests. But when he says, in it, he said to the man, Jesus speaking to this man with the withered hand, come here. And he said to him, is or he said to them speaking to the Pharisees and and I love this about him because he didn't let them get away with stuff when they were doing things and he knew what they were doing he called them on it and he says is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm to save life or to kill but they were silent he said you tell me what what is it is it better to do something good or do something harmful? Is it better to save a life or to allow one to die on the Sabbath? Which is it? And realizing that the question that he had asked them had no answer that they could give that would benefit them. So it said, what did they do? They were silent. They were silent. They had no answer for it. You know, I've thought about every time that you read throughout Scripture when Jesus begins to, when Satan comes and rears his ugly head and, and Jesus confronts him, who has to get quiet and leave? It's not Jesus. It's Satan that has to get quiet and leave. And it says that they were silent. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was restored. And as we were thinking about that, you know, we, we think about the compassion and the love and the mercy of Jesus. But it says, he looked around at them with anger, grieved at the hardness of their heart. And as I was reading this, and uh, it says that in the Greek, this word for anger was in the aorist tense, which is a indicating a, a, a momentary anger. You know, when we read these things, we this wasn't a long, seething, hold a grudge, stay mad forever. This was an anger born out of their lack of compassion. And then, but he was grieved at their lack of compassion. He went from anger to grief to brokenhearted. Because how many times does it talk about Jesus looking over and being brokenhearted for the people? broken hearted for their disobedience broken hearted for the fact <clears throat> that they strayed away from the what uh, from how they should go that they had a lack of love and compassion for their fellow man and when he turned away you know jesus didn't pay attention to them he turned back to the man you know he turned back to the man and told him after he was angered, after he was grieved, he said, stretch out your hand. And I can just imagine him being a man, maybe with his hands all curled up. And so many of us have seen people that may have had a stroke or may have had some sort of disease that just caused their hands to draw into like a little claw and withered up and just be shriveled up and, and unable to be opened. And when Jesus said, stretch it out, and it says, and his hand was restored. He stretched it out. I believe he opened it up. And it's just like when it said that he spoke to the crippled man and immediately strength came into his ankle bones and his legs and he was able to stand and walk. I believe that when this withered hand, it was no longer withered, that it was full, it was complete, it was strong, it was, it was made whole. 
And, you know, and that's what he does to us. He saves us and he makes us whole. Now, we we grow in his grace and his mercy. And so many times we don't speak enough about the fact of the sanctification process the fact that once we are justified and we're saved and it's that we're become just as though we have never sinned then we start to the sanctification process the growing becoming more and more and more like jesus every day and we become stronger but the moment that we're saved we're never going to be any more saved than we are on that day if the lord sees fit to call us out on that moment uh we're saved you know just like the thief hanging by him on the cross and when he cried out to Jesus and recognized who Jesus was, confessed who Jesus was and asked Jesus to remember him, what did Jesus tell him? He said, this day shalt thou be with me in paradise. He didn't say, you got to get off that cross. You got to go get baptized. You got to do a, years of good works, you know, tithe to the church, do all these great and wonderful and mighty things. <clears throat> and then we'll see. He said, today, Today, you'll be with me in paradise. And, you know, I've often thought, you know, what a wonderful thing for that man. He went from the lowest of lows. He went from somebody that was hanging on a cross dying and saying, and he said to the other beggar, we deservedly so because we've done this deeds. This man has nothing, has done nothing to deserving of death. We have. He went from that, recognizing Jesus getting to go to paradise with Jesus. You know, church, what a wonderful thing. What a wonderful gift uh, for that. And and as we uh, look at that and we think about that, we need to realize that, you know, the moment that he saves us, we're heaven bound. Don't know when it's going to be. Don't know how long it's going to be. And it, uh, as long as we're here, as the Apostle Paul says, for me to live is is Christ, for me to die is gain. For us to live is Christ. But as this man with the withered hand, he he opened it up and he held it out. And then on down in the sixth verse, and then we're going to close up with this this afternoon. It says, The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him, how to destroy him. Immediately, they'd gotten a little bit more information, a little bit more of a charge against him, if you would. They were building their case, or so they thought, and but realizing that they needed help. The Jews and the Herodians, they were not friends. Even though the Herodians were Jews, they were Jews that were uh, compliant with uh, Herod. They were Jews that, that supported Herod and the Roman regime. They, these were For a lot of people, they would be called traitors. But the Pharisees, these they went out and they thought, we've got to find somebody that can help us. So as the old saying says, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. They were against Jesus. The Pharisees were against Jesus. And so they thought they would combine forces, even though they didn't like each other. They needed one another to come against Jesus. And they were there to do this thing. They were there as Satan's pawns to try to do a work. But, you know, I we rejoice in what we know coming up to Easter. All the things that Satan meant for evil, all that he thought, boy, I've got this. You know, I've got these religious people bringing charges against him, uh, coming up against him. All these things in, in that manner. We need to understand that God meant for glory because it was through his death, Christ's death on the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection that we have the hope of eternity. And that's a glorious thing to know that even as we read this and think about, well, these Pharisees, you know, pawns of Satan out there doing the things that that they ought not have done. You know, they should have been following Jesus and loving Jesus. Instead, they were tr- conspiring against him. They were just helping make the way to the cross. And, uh, you know, for the things that Satan desires for evil, God can do it, use it for good if we will allow him. And I praise him for that. I thank the Lord for his love and his mercy. I do ask you to 
to be much in prayer for uh, our nation, pray for our churches. And this morning at the church, I, I handed out, put some uh, things back on our um, welcome table about uh, uh, an article written by Randy Davis, the president of the, Southern, uh, the Tennessee Baptist Association. And uh, it was concerning some points that we as churches need to be concerned with concerning the Equality Act. Uh, if you weren't able to be there and get one, if you would like one, let me know. I'll try to see that I can get it sent to you. Maybe I can get uh, uh, Kendall, Judd, or somebody to uh, copy it and put it on our webpage so that you might be able to go to the Piney Level uh, webpage and read these things. But it was an article in the Baptist Reflector. And we do need to pray over these things. We need to pray that God, uh, if it's His holy will, that He'd see fit that this thing would be defeated because it could be very, very de detrimental to our churches the way they are and very, very detrimental to our children and their futures. So join me as we pray. Uh, church, we love you. Thank the Lord for you. Again, don't forget this next Sunday morning, uh, Brother Chris will be preaching. Uh, you know, be sure if you can't come, get him out there on the big screen and get your tablets out, get, uh, however you have to. And let's support him. Let's pray for him. Let him know that you're praying for him uh, to encourage him. Because uh, make no mistake, as a man steps out to work for the Lord, Satan will try his best to hinder and stop him in any way he can. But, you know, the power... The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So each and every one of you that was praying for him, it will strengthen him and it will help him through the grace and the mercies of Almighty God. Join me as we pray. And then if you know of anybody that has any needs this week that we as a church could, could uh, help with, let us know. And also I'll be sending out probably a little bit later uh, some times that I'm going to be at the church working uh, on the library, taking down some bookcases to clean up some of the mess from the the water damage that we had. It appears that the water damage is, is pretty much taken care of. The water has pretty much stopped, so we're going to try to clean up the damage and also they can put the library back together, put the classrooms back together, and because we hope to start having Sunday school classes again just right after Easter. So join me as we pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for this time together. Father, I thank you for loving us so much that you gave your son Jesus to die for us. God, a people that really, Father, not not worthy, God, in, in our worthiness, but Father, only for the mere fact that we were created in your image is the only thing that makes us worthy. And Father, I pray tonight, Lord, that as we go about our week, that we would look around and see those that are hurting We'd look around and see those with withered hands, Lord, and we'd have compassion on them. God, we would see those that are brokenhearted, and Father, that we would love them and pray for them and lift them up. And Lord, more than anything, we just pray that your holy will be done. God, I pray for the church. God, I pray that we would be a light set in the Piney Level community. God, that it would shine throughout our community, God, and throughout this nation, that they might see your love, your mercy, God, and glorify our Father. Lord, we love you. We praise you. And all these things we'd ask in Christ's glorious name. Amen. Love you, church. God bless you. Thank the Lord for you.